get started, uh, if you haven't gotten your coffee and cake yet, whatever, you can go ahead and do that uh, while we'll get started. So let's open up with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you provided for your people of Israel with government through kings. We pray that you would help us learn from the history of those kings how you also provide for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, last week we, we kind of stopped with this. We had seen David's introduction to us um, in, uh, in the book of Samuel uh, and saw his anointing. And we also looked a little bit about, about how this first part of the, this chapter related to the second part, where you have God giving his spirit to uh, David when David is anointed. And then the second part is going to tell us about God giving a different type of spirit to Saul. Um, and of course, the signal here is that, that God has uh, chosen David and rejected Saul. Uh, so let's go on to the second part of the chapter, uh, which is verses 14 through 23. Could we start by uh, having somebody read those for us? 2 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 23. You want 1st Samuel. 1st Samuel. 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 No. Samuel. Did I say 2nd? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. My problem. <laughs> My problem. Sorry about that. 2nd Samuel's not right. 1st okay. Samuel is right. Now the spirit yes. of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting him. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit of God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse in Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his heart and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Okay, so with the Spirit coming on David at the, um, the end of the last account, that's verse 13 in this chapter, now we're told that the Spirit of God leaves Saul and a different spirit comes. And what often shocks people, of course, is this is called an evil spirit from God, right? Now, how could God be the author of evil? Well, um, part of it is a translation problem. Uh, the Hebrew word is translated evil oftentimes just means not evil in the intrinsic sense of the opposite of holy, um, but evil... Uh, oftentimes, in the word that we translate that way, oftentimes can mean something like harmful or something that's less than pleasant. Uh, you know, so you have places in the Bible where, you know, somebody does something harmful to somebody and they say, why did you do this? And a lot of times it's translated evil, but it doesn't mean intrinsically evil. It just means why did you harm me or why did you do something I didn't like very much? You know, so this is not um, necessarily a spirit that is from the devil or something like that. 
Um, but the idea is it's meant to torment Saul. It's meant as part of his punishment. And Saul would see it as something that is less than pleasant. And so it's bad in that sense. Um, but not the, the English word evil just doesn't have the same range of meaning that, that the Hebrew word does here. But at any rate, God's uh, replacing it with an evil spirit. Um, this phrase, uh, evil spirit, comes up a number of times in the Old Testament, and God's in control of the spirits. It's pretty clear that uh, throughout, even in the New Testament, where we have truly evil spirits, Jesus is in control of them, right? I mean, he can cast them out. Uh, they fear him. Uh, and so, no matter how we view this spirit, it's pretty clear that it's under God's control. Um, that these things don't happen simply because uh, the devil wants them to happen or something like that. But this is clearly something that God intends for Saul because of Saul's unfaithfulness. Saul uh, refused to follow God's commands through the prophet Samuel several times. And of course the last time, which is in chapter 15, just before this chapter, God had told him, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to someone else. And so last week we saw who that someone else was, David, and now we see the first part of this process of God taking the kingdom away from him. Well, on verses 15 and 16, it's interesting the, the servants know exactly what's going on. They understand that there's an evil spirit and that it's been sent by God. Maybe the servants uh, are a little bit more aware of what God is up to. And it's interesting that they recommend music therapy. We still use music therapy, right? Uh, for people that have problems. Well, in essence, that's what they're doing. Um, maybe a little music will help. We know that music can change our mood. We know they use it in movies all the time to set the mood, right, on TV. When you hear that ominous music on TV, you want to scream at the uh, screen, turn around and look, somebody's going to attack you or something yeah. like that, right? <laughs> you, you just know that music sets the mood. Um, well, um, Saul's servants are thinking the same thing, that um, a, a little music might help uh, relieve Saul of this problem. Uh, so, um, interesting what Saul's servants know about uh, David. Um, there's a whole list. He's the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. So they know his kind of family connections, right? They know he's skilled in playing stringed instruments. I don't know how they know that. But they know this, this young man is well known for his musical skill. And then he knows he's a prominent man. The Hebrew's up there for me, not for you, to remind me what, what the phrase is. So I remember the connections here. He's a prominent man, which says that you know he comes from a prominent family. And in fact, this phrase is used to describe Boaz in the book of Ruth. And you'll remember from the book of Ruth, Boaz is one of David's ancestors. Okay. Uh, he marries Ruth, and eventually that lie leads down to David. Uh, he's called a warrior already. Um, Saul may not recognize him as such. Uh, we get to the next chapter. Saul's going to have some questions about that. But they already know David has an aptitude to be a warrior. David has to defend that aptitude uh, when he's in front of Saul. Um, but they already describe him this way. Uh, that's interesting. He's eloquent. He, he's, he's a man good with words. And the one thing we know about David is uh, he's good with words because he writes all those psalms, right? Um, but already, as a young man, this is recognized. Uh, he's handsome. The same words you used to describe Joseph... Of course, his handsomeness got him in trouble, right, Joseph, right? Also, Adonijah, um, the son of um, Adonijah, one of the sons of David, is described this way. Um, Rachel was described with these same words. 
So he's got good genes in his family, right? Um, Abigail, one of David's wives that we meet in 1 Samuel, she's described by these words. And Esther, later on in the book of Esther, is described with these words. So this is a, a stock phrase used throughout the Bible to describe people who are good looking. Okay, and David's one of them. And then we're told that Yahweh, the Lord God, is with him, right? Um, and this, we see this elsewhere in the book of Samuel, but this is the first hint to Saul that David was his replacement. Whether Saul picked up on it, I don't know. But here's this guy, he's got all these great qualities, but we save the best to the end, right? God's with him. And of course, that's the contrast right here. The Spirit of God had left Saul. But God is with David. Now, I don't know if Saul caught on to this the first time it was said, but Saul's going to have growing suspicions about David. But right away, the writer of Samuel has introduced to us the contrast so that we begin to see the contrast between Saul and David. Spirit of the Lord, is that the Holy Spirit? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, when the Spirit of the Lord comes on David, he has the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, the Holy Spirit has abandoned Saul, which is a fearful thing. So, a lot, of, a lot is packed into this statement in verse 18. This, I don't know who this servant was in Saul's court, but he obviously knew about what was going on in Bethlehem. Um, now, distances aren't all that great in Israel, um, but even so, you know, you're living in antiquity. Um, most people don't know what goes on 15 miles from them. So how this guy knew, I don't know. Right? I mean, even, let's be honest, even t until the early 20th century, most people didn't know what went on for the most part in the world unless they happened to get a newspaper. But there were a lot of people who couldn't read, and all they knew was what went on in their neighborhood, even in the United States <coughs> 150 years ago. You know, so that this guy knew David does say something about his family being pretty prominent. And maybe this guy was from the Bethlehem area or something, and he knew him. How, how he knows, we don't know. But obviously, David had come to the attention of somebody that he knows this much about him. So he says, get this guy. Now, it's no accident. I'm sure the writer wants us to conclude that God's in control of this event, too. That's why this guy's in Saul's court. But also, the, the human side of it, that he knows this much about David, says something about that. David had come to people's attention already. Uh, and so, you know, in verse 18, a lot packed in there. Uh, verse 20. What a question. Well, yeah. You've covered this already. You can skip over my question. But going back to verse 14, I, I want to know how to respond to somebody. Like When I read this, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Yeah. I can see why maybe that would happen because Saul might reject God or whatever. But then it says, an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. I, 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 how do I come to grips with what that means? Yeah, well, I talked about evil. Maybe it came in okay, late. Yeah, the Hebrew word for evil is not doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as the English word. So this is a word that can just mean something bad or harmful, not necessarily you know, evil in the sense of one of the devil's minions or something like this. Um, and so it might just mean that this spirit is sent by God. It's one of God's spirits. It says, from the, it says from the Lord. Yeah. Um, but his mission is to torment Saul as a punishment for Saul's disobedience and Saul's rejection. I mean, because I, I can see why for other people like read that kind of stuff and think, well, God directly punishes us for our, I mean, it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like the, the, he does sometimes. I mean, those are, you know, to him, whom much is given of him is much required, right? Saul's put in charge of Israel, um, and so there's a big penalty to pay when he doesn't do God's will. Um, and God holds him to that. 
I just think about, you know, you know kind of convincing people that God is a loving, you know, they, they, they use this against me something. Like, yeah. Like, because, like, like, you know, God's well, a loving God. Well, yeah, well, he comes down and it's like. Yeah, and, is, and you can't take one attribute of God and pose it against another. He's also a just God. Right. And you can't say, well, God's loving, therefore he can't be just. Um, no. He can be both. God is both. Um, and, you know, God makes this perfectly clear already in Exodus 20, right? The so-called close of the commandments, which actually comes at the beginning of the commandments, right? I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Right, so there he's a zealous God of justice. Then he goes on to say, in showing mercy to thousands and to love me and keep my commandments, he's also a God of love. To pose one against the other is simply to not understand God and who he is. Um, but people do that all the time, right? Jesus is this loving God. You know, and you have this all the time. Jesus was this loving God. You know, and I said, oh, yeah, you're talking about the same guy who went in the temple and made whips and like, whipped people and drove them out. You're talking about the guy who called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Right? Yeah, he's a loving Savior. But he's also the God of wrath against sin. Yeah, yeah um, by sending the harmful spirit to torment, didn't that give Saul an opportunity to repent? As Absolutely. Well? So, I mean, sometimes bad things happen to us, and God is in charge of all of that as well, and he, I always say, we would never look up if we didn't have problems on, yeah. this, earth, on this earth. And also, it gave, by, by being tormented, it brought David into the uh, palace to, uh, to minister to Saul through his music ministry, yeah. which helped that you know helped him become the next future king as well. So I can see God's hand working in these areas, even though it's something that we don't particularly like to see. We know that God works through bad things as well as good things. Yeah, yeah. And all of this is the 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 author certainly wants you to come to that conclusion. One of the things that you find in the book of Samuel is the author doesn't draw the conclusions for you. He wants you to draw these conclusions for yourself. Very seldom, if, if he stops and tells you, and this is why this happened, you, you should really pay attention, because most of the time, he just wants you to draw the conclusions. And if he stops and draws the conclusion for you, you should probably think that's extra special. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right to draw the conclusion. I think that's exactly the conclusion he wants you to draw. Somebody back in front? Yeah, just like back to Carlton's point, I think, in our culture, we like to kind of generate these abstract notions of, of values that we think are good, so justice, mercy, whatever. But then we like come up with these notions, and then we say, well, now let's let's see how God stacks up uh, when we when we evaluate Him based on these notions that we've created. And, and really, we're we're inverting the relationship. You know, God is at the top of the heap; He's the standard. Everything else has to trickle down from there. But, but then that becomes uncomfortable because what if what if God doesn't stack up to the notion of, of justice that we would like him to to yeah. have but then but then the fault is on our end uh, not on his right yeah uh, we always have this tendency to try to make God in our own image right <laughs> kind of flip Genesis over um, and we you know it's simply oftentimes um, people want to impose their cultural views of what God should be like on God and what he's really like. And one of the, I think, important things we get from scripture is it reminds us that God is not like what our culture, no matter which culture we live in, says he's like. He's like what he is. And he does things his way. He's not like Israel's culture. He does things that sometimes are out of step with what ancient Israel expected. And we see that in the pages of the historical books in the Old Testament. Um, Jesus does things that sometimes are not expected by his culture in the New Testament, which is different than the Old Testament culture. God is what he is, and he's not what our culture necessarily thinks he ought to be. Um, and it's true in our, just as true in our day as it was in Israel's day or in Jesus' day. Um, 
and yeah, so we get these objections largely because of cultural views of what God should be rather than scriptural views of what God is. I mean, it, and it's the same, quite frankly, it's the same with the gospel. People expect the Christian church's gospel to march with the drummer of the current culture. And God help us if we allow that to happen. Because the gospel is what the scripture says it is, not what our culture expects it to be. <clears throat> and, and the gospel divides. Do you think that I came to bring peace? No, but a sword. Right. Yeah, it unites people in faith, but it divides people also between believers and unbelievers. Yeah. So again, it's it's the scriptural definition of God, not cultural definition, and that's that's often the struggle we have. Good. It makes it makes me think like we have to be open to be led by God's Holy Spirit and read God's word as empowered by the Holy Spirit because it's active living and active and like seek God's face and like God tends to I'm just saying this off the bat, you know. Like, yeah, well scripture does challenge us at times and sometimes it's easy for us to just kind of read over those passages that challenge us. <clears throat> You know, and read them through the lens of whatever experiences we've had. But Scripture sometimes does challenge us to rethink um, kind of things that we've assimilated, you know, from our experiences and from our culture. Um, and we don't always see it, but it's, it's usually there. Well, at any rate, the gifts... Um, Bread, wine, and a, and a goat. Interestingly enough, these are the same three items that came to Saul immediately after his anointing. You know, Samuel anointed Saul and told him, you know, now these are the things that are going to happen to you. And along the way, he's going to meet guys, Samuel says, that have these three items. So, I, I'm not sure, but I think the author is trying to say to us there's a reversal here. Saul became king. God gave him his gifts. Saul now is losing his kingdom, but yet these gifts come to him again. Saul, you know, there's a parallelism here. Um, God's still working with Saul, obviously, but um, it's interesting now that these three gifts are brought by David, his replacement, rather than by the prophets who were coming down and Saul joins them after his anointing. Um, so, kind of an interesting thing there. And um, they fulfill Saul's, Samuel's prophecy of a replacement. Samuel prophesied, you're going to get these things to become king. Now these things come to him when his replacement shows up. And he, he's not threatened at all. He still doesn't have really a clue what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I think Saul, you know, Saul has a, a growing awareness through the book of uh, Samuel, uh, you know, the rest of 1 Samuel of David, and pretty soon he's going to figure it out. I mean, you know, he's, he, he's eventually going to say to Jonathan, don't you realize, you know, you should be friendly with David because this guy's going to take the kingdom away from you. You know, he's figuring out, I'm going to give the kingdom to my son, right? Uh, so Saul's going to figure it out and eventually chase David around the countryside, right? I mean, that's much of uh, the last chapters of First Samuel. Um, but at this point, I don't think he really knows yet. He doesn't know about the anointing? I mean, that's Apparently not. Know. Like, how would he not know? Again, no telegraph, no telephone, no cell phones, <laughs> no, you know, things that happened in, in the United States, you know, years ago, unless they were big national news, happened in Washington or New York or something like that, probably didn't make it 50 miles. There was really no publicity about it. Right. It was kind of private. Or right. I mean, you know, something that happens in Wichita Falls stays in Wichita Falls <laughs> because there was no way. You know, nowadays, if if something horrendous happens in Wichita Falls, they have a, a big storm and the city's flooded. We know about it, right? 
probably most people don't know about the governors you know likely to maybe find out about it if it's big enough but that's about it lots of things happen and the people 20 miles away don't even know you know as less Saul happens they have somebody in his court who's there when it happens right or some supporter who comes and tells him I don't know who was first. Um, go ahead. I'm just wondering how common was it for him to get gifts of like red wine and goats? He's the king. He gets them all the time. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that wouldn't really be a, a big red flag to him from getting one. Right. Yeah. It's not going to be that big of a red flag. Yeah. But it's here for us as the reader to make the connection. Right. I mean, yeah. Saul gets them all the time. But why does the why does the writer tell us? about this particular gift. I mean, he's a king, people are always currying his favor, right? Um, that's not a big deal. But the fact that the writer tells us about this one is a big deal for us as readers. Um, I mean, you've got to keep in mind, I mean, this is God's word, but it's also history writing, right? And so we can compare it to other history writing and one thing about historiography, how you tell about history, is that every historian, and the writer of Samuel is no exception to this, has to choose what he wants to tell you, right? So if you read a biography of one of the presidents, choose a president, I don't care which one, Dwight Eisenhower, I'll just choose him at random, I guess. If you read a biography of Dwight Eisenhower, there's lots of things that happened in Dwight Eisenhower's life that the biographer is not going to tell you. He's going to tell you what he thinks things are significant, right? He's not probably not going to tell you what brand of toothpaste he used. <laughs> it's just not significant to the story, right? That he used toothpaste, I think we're all probably clear that he probably did, right? He was a 20th century guy, used toothpaste, right? Okay. But whether he used Pepsodent or Colgate, I don't know. You know, and, and even if the historian knows, he's probably not going to tell you when he writes his biography because it's not significant. The fact that he tells you this here says he's putting some weight on it, some significance to it, and that's why I pointed out. Is there one author for Samuel or are there multiple authors? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because there are different parts that, that are repetitious. And you, you, why is he saying this again and again and again? And the style somewhat changed the, the way they go through it. Yeah, well, I think he has sources, right? I mean, we start with Eli, his priest. We end with the end of David's life, right? David's one foot in the grave when we get to the end of 2 Samuel. We don't quite get his, his death related. The author has sources, and part of that may just be sources. Who wrote it, we don't know. But, you know, many books of the Bible, even in the New Testament, are anonymous. We don't know for sure who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It doesn't say, I, Matthew, am writing this gospel, right? That's an ancient attribution that the gospel is written by Matthew, and I think probably correct. Okay. But the book itself doesn't say, this is written by Matthew. We have some we know. Paul signs his letters, right, at the very beginning. So sometimes we know. But there's, a, there's you know, a lot of books of the Bible that the writer does not identify himself. So I don't know who wrote Samuel. Um, I do know he had to have source material because this covers longer than the lifetime of the author, for sure, from Eli to David. And even if the author is writing, he, he makes it to what he calls the last words of David, right? So it makes it to the end of David's life. So we know he couldn't have written before then. Um, but it's likely he's not alive to see Eli and to see Dan, David, the end of David's life. So he probably has sources, and so some of it, probably the change in style is dictated by the fact that he has different sources that he's drawing on. Okay, um, yeah, so the replacement theme, I think, is important here uh, in this chapter. Um, 
verse 21. Okay, three ambiguous phrases. Your Bible translation probably clears these up, which is maybe not such a good thing. It said that David comes and he's before Saul, right? So David stood before him, probably is what that means. But the Hebrew just says he stood before him. Now, one of the interesting things about the different ways of writing, we go to school, we're taught, do not use a pronoun unless the sand is seen is perfectly clear, right? It's bad writing in Hebrew to use a pronoun, and the reader's not sure to whom you are referring. So that's drummed into us, right? In biblical times, in Hebrew, it's just the opposite. And I, I try to tell my Hebrew students this all the time. You have to figure out who he's talking about. Because their philosophy is, I will use a pronoun whenever it pleases me. And if you're too stupid to figure it out, that's your problem. <laughs> that's just the way they wrote. Okay? This is the way it is. So we have, in Hebrew, he stood before him. He loved him very much. Now, who loves who? Okay? And he became his armor bearer. Now, the first one and the third one, I think, are pretty clear. That the he is David and the him is Saul. Many of your Bibles will say Saul loved him very much. But I'm not so sure that that's the correct understanding. I would suggest to you it's David who loves Saul. Why? Well, Saul's never depicted as loving David. Never, ever. Anywhere else. He sees David as valuable. He's willing to use David. But he it never says Saul loved David anywhere else. It does talk about David loving Saul. David is twice uh, and oftentimes demonstrates love for Saul. He's twice spared Saul's life. And he lamented Saul's death. So I would argue that many of your translations, although they're trying to make it clear for you by saying Saul loved David very much, they're probably not doing you a favor there. I think it's saying David loved Saul. That, that, that David is doing the godly thing here. And it's not that Saul loved David, but that David loved Saul that David becomes attached to Saul. And this is why later on, David is motivated this twice to spare Saul's life. It's why David can't figure out, why is Saul trying to kill me? You know, at one point he says to Jonathan, what's your father got against me? What did I do against him? I've not, never done anything. You know, David loves Saul, is what I think is the message here. I think David is the subject of all three of these. And the direct object, him, is Saul. <clears throat> Just my opinion. I disagree with your Bible translators. <laughs> okay. And I, I have to tell you, I was on a Bible translation committee and argued this and they outvoted me. <laughs> but they said, we, we sat in a room and they said, you're probably right, but we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why, okay. couldn't, why couldn't they do it? Everybody else did it the other way. <laughs> I'm going to re-argue it again. I'm going to change. Trust me. <laughs> I'm going to change. You know, cooler heads will prevail. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I don't... I don't see any evidence that Saul ever shows any real love for David. He, he likes having him around to soothe the evil spirit. He likes having him as a general in his army when, when David's, you know, kind of beating a tar out of everybody, right? He likes using David, but there's never any indication that Saul loves David. And when I think it says he loved him, I think it means David loves Saul. Well, and the, uh, 
I internet I NIV. NIV gets surrounded by saying he liked him very. Doesn't use the word. Yeah, love. it doesn't he use love. Love. <laughs> love. So they they kind of realize there's a little problem there too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The other thing about here is David is called Saul's armor bearer. That's the English term for it. The Hebrew term is actually keeper of equipment, which may mean he was a little more than a squire. And the reason I say this is. In the next chapter, Saul's going to ask for more information about this David guy. You know, Saul probably has a number of squires running around the palace. What's the definition of a squire? What was it? Somebody who serves the king in, in various capacities, keeps, and it's, like I said, the Hebrew word is just keeper of equipment. You know, Saul probably has lots of guys like this. Armor bearer is a little bit more specific, and it and this phrase can be used of the guy who goes in front of the main warrior with his shield, right, and helps him with his equipment in battle. Um, but here, the phrase, although it's translated armor bearer, probably just means he's one of his attendants, the squire's of the king's attendant. How, how old do you think David was when he became um, Saul's? Early 20. Early 20s. Early 20s. You don't have a nine-year-old boy here. No, it's often depicted that way, but I, it's very clear uh, if, when you start trying to put together the history of David's life and how old he has to be at various points, he can't be nine-year-old kid here. He's early 20s. He can't even be a teenager. He's, he's, he's old enough to be recruited into the Army which he will be very quickly. You have to be 20 years old or so for that in ancient Israel. Yeah. Older now, older than now. Yeah, older than the now. I'm sorry to belabor a point, but what is the exact translation of the armor bearer in Hebrew? Like, was it attendant or aid? It's it? it's keeper of equipment. So this this could be anything from the guy who 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 keeps various implements for the king, not necessarily the guy who helps him in battle, which like is what an armor. Equipment, gardening equipment, cooking equipment. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, right, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Sword sharpener. Sword sharpener, <laughs> axe grinder, you know. Wouldn't a better word be then admired him rather than loved him? Well, I but I think it's I think it's David, and I think he does love Saul. I think David is a genuine love for Saul. That Saul does not reciprocate. After all, it's not going to be long before he's chucking his spear at him, right? That's not how you treat somebody you love. You know, happens all the time in marriages, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, one day he's losing, the next day. You know, and that, that also leads the other spouse to say, you don't love me, right? <laughs> right. But, his, but his point is, your feelings towards somebody can change. Right. That's, that's, what, that's yeah. what the point is there. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not sure that there, you can ever find a place, if you want to argue that this one is, then that he loved me very briefly. Because you can't ever find a place elsewhere in the scriptures that say Saul, that says Saul loved David. But you can't find places where David loves Saul. Pretty clearly. Could it be that David respected him because Saul was anointed king? Well, yeah, and David does. Part of his reason for sparing Saul is David is the Lord's anointed, right? The Lord, but David's the Lord's anointed too, right? <laughs> and I mean, David very clearly could have said, God anointed me in place of you off with your head. He had two opportunities to do it, and he doesn't do it. Right. And his excuse is, his public excuse is, he's the Lord's anointed. His men could have come back at him and said, yeah, but so are you. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think it's more than Saul is the Lord's anointed. It's that David has a love for Saul that Saul does not reciprocate. Did his men know that he was anointed? Well, I mean, pretty soon they're going to assume that. No. Yeah. Right? I think word eventually does get around. But it takes a while. 
And David's keeping a seat. I mean, like, uh, what is David thinking this whole time? Like, I've been anointed. What is he, what's, what, how does he... Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but very clearly, David knows that he's going to be the next king. He, know, he knows that in his heart. He just doesn't but talk to it or he, publicize he, it. He, or, he adopts the attitude, God will take Saul out of the way. I don't have to. And indeed, that's what eventually happens at the end of First Samuel. David adopts the attitude, I don't have to force the issue. God anointed me king. God will put me on the throne when it's the right time. He might be thinking, like, oh, oh, poor Saul is going to get killed in a battle, or poor Saul is going to die of some kind of catastrophe. or Yeah, and eventually he does die in battle. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm about to kill this guy to become king. He's not thinking that at no. all. No. No. Although, had he done that, when... He had the opportunity twice later in the book. His men would have supported him. They urged him to do it, as a matter of fact, at one point. You know? Um, so politically, he could have gotten away with it. But David doesn't do it. And I, again, I think it shows David loves Saul in a way that Saul never loves David. What I, I'm seeing from this is like, yes, they were both annoyed. And as you said, he was depending on God if he was going to get him out of the way. It was, and David <coughs> loved God. And like when he could, killed him in the cave, he honors his office and he honors God. And he, you know, like Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's something about loving God where he... He chose to follow God. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, David, I think David has a godly attitude towards Saul, and Saul does not have towards David. Saul has been with the man too long and started getting his head. Well, yeah, Saul's a strange character. He, just, he didn't want to be king, right? They had to drag him out of the bag. If we, last year, if you were in class, yeah. we read that section. Um, but yeah, Saul, once, once he gets to this point in the office, he very clearly wants to leave it to Jonathan. Leave the office to Jonathan. And it's not going to happen. And Jonathan's fine with that, by the way. And Saul is not. We haven't met Jonathan yet much. Well, we had him a little bit, but we're going to have more with Jonathan later. Um, but at any rate, I think it's, it's interesting here how this is translated. And you could read it the other way around. That it's David who loved. And David is the subject very clearly of he stood before him. And he's the subject of he became his armor bearer. It's very clearly David in those two instances. Yes, he's more consistent to just keep it that way. It just seems to me that the middle one is also David loved him. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess it also comes with not reading it consistently all the time. Um, and then you start to realize things. It's like, oh, I didn't even realize that. I never noticed that. that because David and Goliath comes after this. That at this point, is David brought and he lives in the castle? Is Bethlehem close enough that he can go back and forth on the weekend? Or yeah, yeah. He, it, it's close enough that David could go back and forth frequently if he wanted to. You're not talking between because Gibeah, where Saul is, and Bethlehem. <coughs> Yeah, you can you can make that in a day. Right. In, in, but in he's with David and Goliath part of the story. He's at home, and Jesse sends him to go check on his brothers with food. So at right. that point, he's at home. Whereas in this instance, now what we're seeing here, I assumed, oh, he's already living in the palace or something. Well, he might be. You know, he might be spending days at a time. You know, number of days at a time at at the palace. Uh, wherever Saul's residence is, but he's always depicted as being in Gibeah, and Gibeah is not that, that far away. Now, later on, the next chapter, when they're out in battle, Saul's not in Gibeah, right? They're out in battle somewhere, and so David's not. Sent home, then, right, possibly. he can be sent home. They're in battle, so yeah, And keep in mind, again, kings don't have unlimited resources. They don't have standing armies. Okay, you... you you get all these guys who are normally farmers to come out with whatever implements they can. That's how you raise an army. They have a small palace guard, right? 
Um, they don't have standing armies. And there's a reason for that. You gotta feed all these guys, right? If you're gonna have a standing army, you're gonna have to feed them. Um, that gets expensive. It's expensive for the United States to have a standing army. For years and years and years, we cut back in between every war, right? What we do in modern days is not what we did, you know, 250 years ago. We had very few people in a standing army in the United States, and most countries didn't. Did the same thing. It's expensive to have a standing army, and so kings didn't do it. Well, the same thing with other courtiers. When the king's out on the battlefield, they're not needed. Send them home. Let mom and dad feed them, or let them go feed themselves on their own property. We're only going to bring them back to the palace when the king's in residence. So it's not surprising to find David back in Bethlehem when Saul's out with the army. Yeah. Were David and Jonathan beginning a friendship here at this point in time? Not yet. It's not until after this Goliath incident. Okay. We'll, we'll see that when we get to chapter 18 or end of 17, beginning of 18. I mean, I've already piqued my interest because the fact that you just raised that's like, you think of David as a, like a you know twelve year old kid, but now I, I, we even read David Goliath. Now he's twenty. He's now he's twenty. He's like, yeah, like he's basically a full grown man. Really. Yeah, you he's know? he's at least twenty. I mean, if you read the 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 legislation that Moses gives, you got to be twenty to serve in the army. Okay, so he's at least twenty. Was he in the army? <laughs> not yet, but he will be shortly. So he's not. Yeah. Well, if you want to make him 19 now, that's fine, but he's got to be 20 very shortly. <laughs> so is it more so that he didn't go fight with his brothers because someone had to stay behind, or because Jesse was guarding him because he was the youngest, so he was well, leaving? Yeah, right. The, the oldest three are going to be in Saul's army, we're going to find out in the next chapter, right? David's got David's number eight. Um, Saul raises an army, right? Jesse's not going to send every one of his sons out, right? So he sends the oldest three out. Uh, and Eliab is probably 10, 12, 15 years older than David. So, um, so yeah, you know, you raise an army, not the whole, not the entire male population doesn't come out and serve in the that's an army, right? Um, but yeah, so David's probably 20. Jonathan, by the way, when we meet him is, uh, and his friendship with David, at that point, he's probably 40. I mean, they have this friendship, but it's not they're the same age. I know we used to see the Sunday school pictures and they're the same age, right? <laughs> Jonathan is probably 20 years older than David. He's, he's his mentor, if anything. You've got to think of Jonathan more as a, a friend and mentor. I mean, this happens all the time. I'm sure it happens to you, uh, too. And, you know, at, at work, you can be friends with somebody that you're, there's much bigger age difference, but and you're a friend, but kind of mentor, right? Not that everybody. would make Saul like 60 at this point. Yeah, yeah, Saul's pretty old. He's going out <laughs> fighting at 60? He's the king. <laughs> they have to restrain David later on. You know, in 2 Samuel, they have to restrain David from going out and fighting with the the troops when he gets old. Right? If the troops say, you're not going to go out with us again at one point. And this is related. Actually, it's late in the book of Samuel, but probably is an earlier incident um, where the troops say, uh -uh, not anymore. You're too valuable. You're not going to go out. But that's the king's job. I mean, it's not, again, it's not like modern warfare where the generals are back behind the line somewhere. The general's up in the front of the line. Well, that's why I can see if it was modern warfare. He, you could be 60, you could be back there just calling the shots. But if you're 60 on the front line, that's a, well, that's a whole different story. George Washington's an old man, and he's out leading his troops on the front lines. Right? I mean, there's stories about people marvel at Washington not being killed. He has bullets going through his coat, right? And, and not him. You know, he's out on the front lines. It's not modern warfare. You know, Caesar goes out with his troops. Caesar's out there with a sword, right? 
That's why they respect him. <laughs> That's why they respect him. That's why they thought Saul was such a good guy. He was a big strapping guy, right? We're told he's a head taller than everybody else. This is the guy to lead us out the battle, right? Because everybody's out there fighting, including the generals. Well, uh, 17. Yeah, we're at 17 already? Okay, that was the end of 20. Yeah, that's it. At the end, that's the last thing I have to say, unless you have any questions on the last verses. Um, we've got five minutes. We can't get very far into David and Goliath. But um, let's go to chapter 17, and let's see, which verses should we read? <coughs> Let's take it slow, because we only have five minutes. Let's just take the first two verses. Could somebody new read for us 17, 1 and 2? Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sulpa in Judah. They pitched camp at Gephes, Ammon, between Sulpa and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and in and camped in the valley of Ella, and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. Okay, so this is the setting. Now, we, you read these places, you go, where is this? Okay, well, keep in mind the Philistine territory is on the southwest of Israel. Um, Gaza today, where the, um, you know, we talk about the... Um, Palestinians being in Gaza. Gaza was one of the Philistine cities. Okay, there are five, at this point in history, there are five Philistine cities uh, on, on the Mediterranean coast in south, well, we would think of as southwest Israel. Okay. This is on the border between what's seen as Israelite territory and Philistine territory. Okay, so the places that are mentioned here may not mean much to you, but that's what they are. So between Sukkah and Az, uh, Azekah, uh, Ephes, I mean, is the border between the two. Okay. Now, what you're being told here is they're drawing up their battle lines, and one's on one hill, and one's on the other hill. Right. And so you got the Philistines on, I guess, the southwest Side, and on the northeast side, you've got Saul and his troops, the Israelites. Okay. Um, the Philistines are the big threat here. Um, they, they were at the um, end of the book of Judges. They remain the big threat in 1 Samuel. It was the Philistines who captured the ark. We saw that uh, when we looked last year or the year before at part of 1 Samuel. Uh, and so the Philistines are still a big threat. And you have basically here a stalemate. And this is why Goliath is going to do what he does. Because they're both on a hill. Neither one wants to attack the other one because you, nobody wants to fight going uphill, right? You've got to go down in the valley and back up. You're giving them the advantage. Right? So there's this stalemate as they're both sitting on the hill staring at each other. Right, and so what we're going to get when Goliath comes down into the valley and challenges them is basically a proposal of how we're going to break this stalemate. Okay, and we're out of time. Quick <laughs> question: They both yeah. speak the same language. Um, they probably speak similar languages. We don't know anything about the Philistine language. They didn't leave behind any inscriptions. Um, Hebrew is in a group of what we call Canaanite languages. And they're all very similar. So they're somewhat mutually intelligible. And if the Philistines, who are probably latecomers to the land, have adopted one of these Canaanite languages, um, then their language is probably intelligible by the Israelites, and they would say, oh, that's a quaint way of saying it. We wouldn't have said it that way. 
but we understand what he means. And they're coming trying to get, they're trying to control more land, or there's just bad blood between the two groups over the years? The Philistines are always looking to expand. They're, they're looking for land, basically. Yeah. The Philistines are looking to expand. They're probably from the Mediterranean. They're probably more European stock than Asian stock, like the Israelites are. Uh, and they've been living there in this land with these five cities and looking to expand um, into uh, territory that the Israelites own. But the Israelites got there first. The Israelites got there first, probably, yeah. I mean, we have mentioned of Philistines in Abraham's day, but I think those are probably a different but related ethnic group. But Palestine is a derivative of the Philistines. Yeah. But it's they've been not, there for that, 400 years, right? They've been there for about 400 years because yeah. it's been 1,400. Yeah, they've been close to 400 years in the land Israel has been. The Philistines are probably relative new, newcomers compared to that. Yeah. Okay, well, let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do indeed raise up leaders for your people. We pray that you would.